Amen. I do encourage you to return to Isaiah 58 this summer. Return to that text. Pray that, uh, that, that we would not be a people that know the Lord up here, but that we would know him in our hearts and that would go through our hands. To finish this Isaiah series, I, I want to invite you to open to Isaiah 66, the last chapter in the book of Isaiah. You can find that on page 625. And the children, you can go to Children's Church. Thank you for the strong whisper, Pastor daughter. And kids, if I ever forget, well, I'm not going to say that. We don't want kids running everywhere. <clears throat> Isaiah 66. page 625 in the Blue Pew Bible. I began this sermon series back in March saying that all of Scripture, all of the Bible is glorious, like a sunset over the fields of central Illinois, but there are particular passages in the Bible that are majestic. They're like the national parks of the Bible, majestic in their beauty. And it's my opinion that Isaiah is a majestic book of the Bible. I hope you've sensed that in these last 14 or so weeks, that you marvel more at the nature of God and the beauty of his word. I also hope that as we leave Isaiah today, that this would not be the last time that you leave it, but that you now have better categories in your mind, the categories of Israel's sin, God's judgment, and his redemption. Those are the three big categories, sin, judgment, and redemption. And redemption is coming through the promised Messiah who will reign on the throne of David. And that with those categories, you can enter back into Isaiah easier and read it and understand it and appreciate the beauty of this book. Over the past 14 weeks, we've seen that one of the primary problems in the hearts of the nation of Israel is that their God is too small. They did the church thing But they didn't have a reverent fear and awe of the Lord. It's been said throughout the series that their God was like a little uh, puppy dog in a purse. A cute accessory without much bark or bite. They had domesticated the Almighty. They'd relegated the Lord to a little time slot in their weekly schedule for worship. So all throughout this book, Isaiah has been saying in various ways, Behold your God. Consider the Almighty. Think about the Holy One. He's not a a hobby. He's not an add-on to our lives. He's not an old buddy. He's creator and redeemer, the Almighty, the King of the heavens. There's none like Him. And we come to Isaiah 66 this morning. I want to look at just two verses as our primary text, but we'll go to a few others. Two verses, Isaiah 66, 1 and 2 to just hold up the nature and beauty of God one more time this morning and say, behold your God, and then see what we're called to do in response. So let's read together Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me, and what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be, declares the Lord. But this is the one to whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. This is a declaration. It's an announcement. The Lord says, heaven is my throne. Translation, I'm the king of the universe. My throne is in a little place called the heavens. (laughs) I'm over all things. I'm the authority of the universe. A couple years ago, I was driving in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and if you've ever been down there, it is a sprawling metropolis with like 17 different downtowns. I was just thinking, seeing all these tall buildings, that each of these buildings has bosses in them. People who are in charge and in authority, presidents and CEOs and executives. Somebody in these buildings has the nicest office, the floor-to-ceiling windows with fancy desks and making big decisions for millions or billions of dollars in, in each of these buildings. And some of them may be humble, but Texas is not known for its humility. And so I'm thinking that some of them probably think they're a big deal. And I'm going, 
pride is so silly. Because the person in that building that has the cool office may think that they're really, really, really something, and there's a building right next to them with somebody in that building that has the best office. And then two miles away, there's a whole other cluster of buildings. And two hours south, there's a whole other city with buildings. The Lord looks at the pride of man and he goes, if your heart is lifted up and you think you're something awesome and special, you're just not. (laughs) My throne is in heaven. Psalm chapter 2 verse 4 says, he who sits in the heavens laughs. He holds them in derision. Derision means ridicule. The Lord, the King of kings, the boss of bosses, the authority of authorities, looks at all the the pride of mankind, all the offices and boards and elected seats and, and actual earthly thrones, and he says, that's ridiculous, <laughs> if they're in pride. Now, of course, you can hold those offices humbly and to the glory of the Lord, but there's a lot of pride in that. The, the point is, the gap between who God is and who we are is indescribably massive. And that spirit needs to fall upon his people, upon his church. He is, he, there's none like him. Like, in Isaiah, we not only see that God is great, we also see that man is pretty small. Chapter 40, the nations are as a drop in the bucket, a speck of dust on the scales. Chapter 40 again, God is enthroned above the circle of the earth. Here, listen to this, its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Chapter 41, Israel is a worm. Chapter 63, All the works of man are like a withered leaf. Chapter 64, the Lord is potter and we are clay. (laughs) We're Play-Doh in the hands of God. The most accomplished, beautiful, successful, intelligent, winsome person you know is a dust worm grasshopper fleck of Play-Doh in the sight of God. The Mona Lisa, dust. The Great Wall of China, a worm. All 46 presidents of the United States put together, with all due respect to their office, grasshoppers. Heaven is my throne, says the Lord. The earth is my footstool. This majestic, rotating, biological, chemical masterpiece that we are on right now is the footstool of the Lord. And if you think about all all the furniture, I mean, I'm not super into decor, but I, I, I think that Footstools of, of all the furniture are the most functional piece of furniture, right? Like, you don't really need a tricked out footstool. You just need like a box, a cooler. That's what you need. Because the point is the person using the footstool. And the Lord says, the earth is where I put my feet. Just don't forget that, people of God. The earth is my footstool for my non-physical feet. That's what it is. And interestingly... One of the subplots of this book in Isaiah has been whether or not Jerusalem and the temple and and, and the throne of David will last. Well, it's interesting that in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, when David, King David, wants to build the temple, and it turns out it's going to be his son Solomon that builds it, King David gathers a bunch of important people around, and he says this, this is 1 Chronicles 28, he says, hear me, my brothers and my people, I had it in my heart to build a house of rest for the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord for the footstool of our God. King David had it right. When he wanted to build the most beautiful, ornate, gold-plated building to show glory to the Lord, even then he said, the best we can do is going to be a footstool. When we go to worship and encounter the presence of God, we might see the bottom of his foot. That's it. That's the right heart. But what happened? The footstool became the object of worship rather than the one who sits upon the throne. We've seen that throughout Isaiah. They're going to church. They're they're fasting. They're tithing. They're worshiping. They're singing. They're praying. And the Lord says, your hearts are far from me. Look in verse 3 of chapter 66. It says, he who, so this is all all worshipy stuff. It says, 
He who slaughters an ox is like one who kills a man. He who sacrifices a lamb like one who breaks a dog's neck. He who presents a grain offering like one who offers pig's blood. He who makes a memorial offering of frankincense like one who blesses an idol. They're doing all the churchy stuff and their hearts are far from the one who sits on the throne of heaven. And he looks at all, I mean, they're giving offering and he says, you might as well be breaking a dog's neck. You might as well be worshiping an idol because I know it's in your hearts. Church, we've seen this throughout the past few months. This is a warning for us. This is a caution because it is so easy to do, isn't it? It's so easy to make this moment about the footstool, about the moment itself, rather than the one who sits upon it. I I praise God for our musicians who practice and who who grow in skill and lead us in worship, but musicians, anybody that ever comes up here that makes music, just be, be, be cautioned not to make it about making music, but to make it about making worship to the one who sits on the throne of heavens. Preachers, me, Grant, Jordan, Marcus, Michael, others, Lord willing, many others that that will preach. It is good and right to to prepare sermons and to be diligent in that task, but how easy it is to talk about God rather than to talk to him, the one who sits on the throne of heaven. Church body, it is easy to make our Sunday morning about a hundred little things that make our Sunday morning about us and what we want instead of about encountering the one whose throne is in the heavens. And think about the global historical church, the focus on building sanctuaries. Not all a bad thing to display the glory of God, but how easy it is to get wrapped up in the sanctuary itself rather than the one who is sanctified, whose throne is in the heavens. May God save us. I mean, this is my heart's plea coming out of Isaiah. May God save us from blindness to who he is. I mean, Isaiah's been shouting about the glory of God and what a, what a tragedy it is if we are a people who are ho-hum, just sort of apathetic about the glory of the one whose throne is in the heavens. 50, Isaiah 57, he is the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity whose name is holy. Chapter 51, maker, he's the maker who stretched out the heavens and made the foundation of the earth. Chapter 56, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. I love this. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purposes. Isaiah chapter 45, I form light and darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. That's how sovereign our God is. I am the Lord who does all these things. There is none who can deliver from my hand. I work and who can turn it back. I love this, chapter 43. I am he who blots out your sins for my own sake. Think about that. We are are the massive recipients of the forgiveness of God. He blots out our sins in Christ on the cross, and he says, I actually do that for my own sake, to show the glory of my grace. I blot out your sins. Chapter 44, I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. Chapter 66, my throne is in heaven. The earth is my footstool. He is not a puppy in a purse. He's the uncontainable, inconceivable, uncomparable king of the heavens. I want more of that. I want more of that. Don't you want more of that type of God rather than the God who fits into the church thing? (laughs) I want him to be out of this room and all over my life. I want to wake up on a Tuesday and have awe of God. I want to be driving in my car on a Thursday thinking about nothing and I have the holy righteous fear of the Lord. This is the God of the Bible. And yet, he actually cares about us. You see, all those scriptures I I read are are true, but, but if I stop right there, we might just think that we're 
grasshopper worm dust, and he just doesn't care. He's just a heavenly dictator. We're just pawns. But astonishingly, he's our heavenly father. He loves us with a deeper love than we can conceive. Skip back one chapter to Isaiah chapter 65. I I love how, how it does this. In chapter 66, it shows the power of God by talking about his feet. In chapter 65, it talks about the love of God by talking about his hands. Isaiah 65, 1 through 3. Listen to the mercy here. He says, I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that was, called, that was not called by my name. I spread out my hands all day to a rebellious people who walk in a way that is not good, following their own devices, a people who provoke me to my face continually. Here in that, the heart of our king, the one whose throne is in the heavens, says, and yet I hold out my hands all day to a disobedient and obstinate people. He says, I was ready to be sought. I was saying to the wayward, scholars debate, is this talking about Israel? Is this talking about the Gentiles? Is this talking about both? We don't know. The point is this talking about God. He's patient. He's saying, here am I here am I, come to me. He's inviting us to relationship. Do you remember chapter 55 where he says, come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters and he who has no money, come buy and eat, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. The Lord is saying, come to be in relationship with me. There's an open invitation and yet a lot of people hear that and they go, eh, eh. They're indifferent. But worse than that, Verse 2 says that the, many times we are rebellious to the king of kings. He says, I spread out my hands all the day to a rebellious people. Another translation calls that obstinate people. They are hard of heart. They are dug in. They are callous. They are not intent on changing. They are, as verse 3 says, people who provoke me to my face continually. You know what it means to be provoked? It means to be agitated or instigated. First thing that came to my mind is uh, when a child says like 340 times in one day, Mom, 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 Mom. 341st time, Mom says, Your dad's right there! Not that my kid's mom's ever done that. (laughs) Right? But it just just gets at you. But, But there's another type of provocation that this says is to your face. This is like professional athletes when they taunt each other. I thought of, maybe only a few sports fans remember this, but Malice at the Palace in 2004 where Ron Artest and Ben Wallace got in a fight and got in each other's face and then Ron Artest, who later changed his name to Meta World Peace, which doesn't make any sense at all, but anyway, he, he's sitting there on the, on the sideline and a fan throws a drink and it hits him in the face. And he runs into the stands, and it got crazy. Fans are jumping in. Tons of fans start throwing stuff. It's worth a YouTube, maybe, if you're into that. <clears throat> and literally, I think every player got suspended. There were five arrests of players. $11 million of fines were handed out from that one incident, and they called the game. But anyway, that's totally irrelevant to the sermon. The point is... He got hit in the face with a drink. And when that happens to us, we react, right? We're provoked. And this text is saying, that's what Israel did to the Lord. They threw beer in his face. They said, we don't even care. Whatever. He is slow to anger, abounding in love. He is not easily provoked. As Jesus, the word made flesh, would later say, turn the other cheek. The one whose throne is in the heavens and the earth is his footstool turns the other cheek to worm, fleck, dust, Play-Doh pieces. This is our God. This 
is our God. That is a lot of restraint by the Almighty. He holds out his hands all the day long, and he says, return to me. Remember our memory verse. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man, his thoughts, let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God that he may abundantly pardon. That's what the Lord does. He holds out his hands and right now, if there are situations in this faith family where you just want to be done with somebody, maybe it's a family member, maybe it's a neighbor, a coworker, whatever it is, where you're just like, I am done, I am done, done. Anybody been there? Don't raise your hand. This would be a great passage to pray. Because doesn't our God have every right to just go like that? <laughs> this passage shows the mercy of our God. How many times have we wandered in sin and thrown something in his face and he says, come back. Come back to me. Return to me. You see, Isaiah was preached way before Jesus came on the earth. But Isaiah sets up the two poles of the gospel. He is the king who is gracious. Jesus is full of grace and truth. When Jesus came, his first message in Mark chapter 1, he says, repent for the kingdom is here. He's saying, the king is here, so turn from your way and come on into the kingdom. Isaiah preached the word, Jesus is the word made flesh. And it's these poles in Isaiah, Isaiah's pre-gospel. It's the king of kings with his arms outstretched. And Jesus comes, preaches a kingdom, and he stretches out his arms for all people. And what were they doing while he's on the cross? <laughs> They're obstinate. They're probably throwing things at him. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's in view of this kind of God, this kind of power, and this kind of grace that we get our response in verse 2. And this is a fitting place to end our Isaiah series, Isaiah 66, 2. But this is the one to whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. We're religious people. The people in Isaiah's day were religious people. And God says, you know, gathering together is good. Corporate worship is good. But if your heart isn't humble before me and contrite, contrite means repentant. You know, tremble at my word, then, then forget about the gathering. Remember Malachi? Remember that series a few years ago? The prophet Malachi said, shut the doors of your worship. That's kind of how Isaiah is. He says, I'm after the heart, a broken and contrite heart, people who are bothered by their sin. I think of Luke chapter 18 where Jesus tells a parable and there's a Pharisee who prays in the temple courts and the Pharisee says, Lord, thank you that I'm not like all these other people. Thank you that I, that I tithe and I haven't committed all these sins. And then it says there's a tax collector who stands far off and he beats his chest and he says, God have mercy on me, a sinner. That's a contrite heart. And the Lord says, that's the one to whom I will look. Church, I want this. I want this. I want to be people who take sin seriously. I'm not saying we have to shed tears every time we sin. But man, don't, don't, don't you get, I don't think this is just me, don't you just get kind of indifferent about your sin? Just don't take it that seriously. I look at this and I go, God, give me a soft heart. Th think about King David. King David commits adultery and he commits murder. And then in Psalm 51, he says, against you and you only have I sinned. He's like, God, I've, first and foremost, I have sinned against you. And what was David later called? A man after his own heart. I want to tremble at his word. There's a, there's a, there's a seriousness, a solemnity about hearing and, 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 and uh, handling God's word. 
Like if, if you're a scientist in a lab with some chemical compounds that, that could be explosive, you don't just go, oh, let's just mix a little there. there no. Like you take the directions seriously because there's implications. I want to handle this word with, with serious implications and go, I want to hear it correctly. I want to know it and meditate it and memorize it. Most of all, I want to do it. I don't want to shrug at his word. I don't want us to be a, a faith family that shrugs at the word of God. But to tremble at his word. And sometimes those who tremble at his word, that actually this means for all of us, at some point in our life, God is going to call us to do something clear in his word that we're not going to feel like. And those who tremble at his word say, by faith, I, I, I will do it. I want to tremble at his word instead of being complacent and plateauing until the day we die to say, Lord, we want to obey, 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 obey. We don't just want to hear, we want to do. What a promise, the Lord says. This is the one to whom I'll look. If you're humble and contrite in heart, you tremble at my word. He whose throne is in the heavens, whose feet are on the earth, looks to us. He looks to us. I, I pray that we take this to heart. I just close the Isaiah series right now. We are religious. We are. There's, there's no getting around it. We gather for, for worship. We pray prayers. We give. We sing. Many people here know more of the Bible than, than many believers have known throughout world history but by, by a far measure. We are religious. And all those things are good, but do we tremble at the word of God? Do we just have holy, awesome fear and praise his name that he says, when you have fear, my hands are outstretched to you. I'm not just a cosmic king, I'm a cosmic father, and I will look to him who has a humble heart and trembles at my word. Amen. Father, we want your word to reign in our hearts in such a way that we delight in you as our king. That when we hear your word, it doesn't feel like a a barked out command, but the gracious instruction of a benevolent king. Oh God, help us to tremble at your word. Spare us, spare us, spare us from religiosity and spring up living faith among us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Mm-hmm.